this is the first time teaching in this setting, this seat, this little thing, this night. Um, it's good to see you. You know, what, let me just tell you, that, and, I, and I hope I never get over this. I'm always amazed that anybody shows up. And, and so I just get excited. So I'm really glad you're here. So it's good. Yeah, we're good. It's good. It's good we're all here. Um, shout out to online viewers. Um, I oftentimes forget that. You know, we, this always surprises me. Um, a lot of people pay attention to us that we don't know. And or that, you know, I'll see people someplace and they say, man, what went on in church the other, you know, last week was like, I don't even know you. Where did you, you know, I've never seen you at our church. How do you, and they, they watch online. So um, shout out to all you online viewers. You're pretty doggone awesome. Because um, we will at times, and this is not uncommon, like our Sunday services will get two to 300 viewers. Um, little clips we throw out, three minute teachings and so not uncommon to get 500, 600, 800 viewers um, on those things. So the word just goes out there. So, you know, a lot of nasty stuff out there on the world, what is uh, the interweb, as good old George Bush said. Um, but uh, might as well redeem anything we can out of it. Amen. All right. You okay with me sitting like this? I, I, I think after we built this thing, we built it like three inches too high or six inches too high. So... I felt with a smaller crowd, I better sit down. It's perfect when the place is full. It's a little bit high when the place is... Um, don't, so. lean don't lean forward. I've never... Actually, I have fallen off a stage once, but it's very uncommon that I do that, so... <laughs> All right. You know, I was thinking, this is... Um, is today September 13th? Yeah. And, and of course, 9-11, when it happened in 2001, was on a Tuesday. Looking around, pretty much all of you in here remember it. Um, isn't it crazy that nobody in high school remembers 9-11? What happened? Where did it go? You know, no, seniors were not, well, they were, they were babies. Like Sophie's, oh, she's a junior, so she's not a senior, but see, it, what is, 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 uh, she, is she a junior? So she was born, uh, were you pregnant? Okay, you were pregnant when 9-11 happened. Oh yeah, Sydney, you were not alive. Yes, very good to have one. <laughs> Elena is not alive either. Very good. And neither is little Henry, who's only two. So lest I forget all the young people. But um, I was thinking back to, um, we have not had, interestingly, we, we used to have Thursday night services um, for years. We started them in 1994, and we, we quit them about, um, about 2003, somewhere around there. Um, because we went to multi-services on Sunday. But Thursday nights were really, they were, they were cool times. They were special times. We'd have a lot of people here, and it, God did some really cool things. But um, 2001 was one of the more, was the most unique Thursday night service we ever had. Um, and our service was scheduled by the newspaper. Um, this was a funny thing. It was Tuesday, of course, 9-11 happened. Everybody's in this panic, and we're like, what in the world? You guys remember it. It was just, you know, it was unlike anything. I hope I never experience anything like that again. I hope I never experience the uncertainty or anything. Then Wednesday, of course, was an odd day because, as you know, no, no planes were in the air. We didn't know what was going on. You know, it was, I think it was Wednesday when they had the joint sessions of Congress, and that was, was that, remember that? It was kind of scary watching that. I can remember watching um, President Bush speak and thinking, are they going to get blown up? You know, what's going to happen at this time? Well, Wednesday during the day, um, I don't remember which one, but somebody from the Warren newspaper called us up here, and I, I guess, I don't know why I was, because I was not lead pastor at that time, but I seemed to be the one who led a lot of the stuff at that time, and um, and the newspaper guy said, and I don't even remember who our secretary was. It might have been you. Was it you? And, and they said, oh, are you guys having a prayer service tomorrow night? So I don't think it was you in 2000. Oh, in 2001. Yeah, I was thinking, two, yeah, 2001. And she says, hey, Rick, are we having prayer service tomorrow night? It's the newspaper. And I'm thinking, well, of course we are. <laughs> we had no intention of doing this. But if the newspaper's calling you, wanting to know if you're, because we want to publicize it and all that stuff. And she said, yeah, we were scheduling that anyways. So, and so we had it, and it, they, they promoted it. The newspaper promoted it. And, and a lot of you were here. This place was packed. It was packed. 
and, and I mean, people all over the altars praying. And it was, I mean, there were probably 400 people in here. And it was actually really odd because then the newspaper, it was like the paparazzi was here. They're on the altar. Does that, do you remember that? They're, they're like taking pictures. Stop, stop. I finally had to go over there and says, guys, this is, I know you want to get a shot, but you've got to have a zoom on that lens. You know, go someplace. So, but it was, it was one of those times where, as I, and it just reminded me, because this is the 13th, and that was the 13th, that you know what? There is something. I want you to hear this. No matter what people are displaying, there's something inside of them that wants to seek God. Period. That, you know, the book of Ecclesiastes says he has placed eternity in the hearts of man. And I really believe that. It's in there. What brings it out? Well, if we knew what it was, we would just do it. And, that, you know, I would have done it in my life sooner. You would have done it sooner in your life. But there's something inside of us. And that, that night was like, and of course, the whole nation, right? I mean, everybody was praying. Suddenly, we had 340 million people of faith for like two weeks. Everybody was. Actually, it lasted long. It was a pretty cool thing that happened at that time. And, but, but I'm just saying, it, it just, you gotta, we know this, but just re, it's a good reminder. God has people, and at any moment, at any moment, something will have them turn to, that, turn to him. And, and it's going to be legit. It's going to be lasting. It's going to be long-term. And so, uh, I don't know, just had to go on a little memory lane with you um, as I was thinking about that. Praise God. Evan Oaks, like these people don't even know you. You're a nice guy, man. You and Chrissy, thank you so much for leading. Evan is actually um, not anything terribly official, but he's the worship leader at Levant. I mean, at uh, Fluvanna. We can say that, worship leader, and, and among other things. And so I was talking with Evan, and so I said, hey, would you ever want to come down here and lead worship? He says, sure. So he actually may be um, maybe monthly or something leading on our Thursday night. So he's just a great guy, good friend of ours, um, I don't know. It makes me sound super old when I tell you how old he was when I was coaching. <laughs> I think you were like in seventh grade when I was coaching at Bethel. Sixth grade. There we go. Sixth grade. I was like 12 myself um, back, back in the day. For whatever reason, Zachary thought it was important to tell Sandy and I yesterday that from today, 2042 is as far away from us as 1994 is in our past. I'm like, why would you tell me that? And he said, Dad, you were alive in 1994. <laughs> Just barely. So, so those of you who thought like 2042 is forever far away, well, it might seem like 1994 was yesterday. There you go. Then 2042 is tomorrow. So, all right, into, into the book of Genesis. Um, uh, my, my, my goal on the, on the, on the Thursday nights is pre, stay pretty committed to making sure, one of the reasons we want to start at 6.30, the reason we say 6.35 is hopefully you remember that. Um, and we really want to start at 6.35. So if you need to think it's 6.15, you think it's 6.15. Uh, so we want to start at 6.35 because I want to make sure, I really want to make sure we're done by eight. Um, and so therefore, if, you've, you know, if you're driving or if you have kids, you know that eh, I can be pretty committed to come there. I, I really want to encourage if, if, if young people um, want to grow in their walk with the Lord, you cannot beat midweek services where you're with other believers worshiping and getting into the word. You just can't beat it. And so um, if you get young people, drag them out here, get them out here. It'd be a good time too. We'll have a fun time here. So we're going through the, 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 the whole of the Bible. Uh, we began at Sunday and we started with Genesis 1, you know, the first five words in the beginning. Um, it, it, it has provoked a lot of questions. People have, have and things people have said to me. It's been fun. I love it when people start to think about things they don't normally think about that are important. And the beginning is really important. If you don't know your beginning, you have no idea where you are today. And so um, what I want to do, though, especially in, in, uh, in all, of, all the time, but especially for these two weeks when we're in Genesis 1 through 11, I just want to teach you what the Bible says. Now, there can be, oh, what about this? What about that? that? That's fine. I love those questions. I like going outside the box and that, but I really want to stay true. I'm just going to teach you what the Bible says and just throw it out to you, and then you can run with it from there. Because it really starts to get really fun um, from Genesis 5 to Genesis um, 
11. It starts to get really in a, in a funny thing. Um, Wednesday at chapel, we were, um, we were talking about Cain and Abel, which, you know what? I, I don't know. Nobody teaches on Cain and Abel. It was super fun at chapel. Um, when, when, you know, it was really fun when Cain killed Abel. It was awesome. Um, but, but from that point, watch what happened. Let me just walk you through a little bit of a timeline. Cain killed Abel, and we know this and, and uh, if you read over the scripture, you may have questions, but it's pretty obvious when you think about it. Um, there were a lot of people. We are, it is listed Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. But it doesn't make any sense to think that Eve didn't have other kids. In fact, if she was the mother of all humans, which is what Eve means, she probably had a lot of kids. She had, she had basically perfect genes, well, she did. Not basically, she did. And, and the command was be fruitful and multiply. I think she had a lot of kids. And so, because uh, Cain had a wife and got this and family started to come out there. You say, well, it's always good to say this, but you know, where would Cain have gotten his wife? Hello, there weren't anybody else on the earth except for sisters. So Cain got his wife from a sister. He's like, oh, Relax. It was a perfect gene pool. There were no problems. Uh, there, there was no, there was nothing. There wasn't no disease. They weren't going to get any. There was not, it was perfect. And then, as you know, everything progresses from good to bad. That's just what it's, you know, science says that. The second law of thermodynamics. Look at that. I just said something fairly smart. Um, it says everything goes from order to chaos. It just does. And it goes, and things get worse as we get farther away from the original. The original was God, Adam, and Eve, and everything from that starts to get worse, which is a major kick in the teeth of people who think we keep getting better. We're not. We're getting worse. The older you get, the worse you get. I don't have to, you know, I don't have to prove that to you. Uh, somebody said, I'm reminded every morning when I get out of bed, that I'm getting old. <laughs> so you're just getting, that's how the, the world is going. So, so there was a lot of people on the earth. Uh, they, they began to populate. There were families that were grow, you know, growing and then other people were born and there were wives here and husbands here and kids there and all that stuff. And also about this is called the, these are fancy words that people throw on, anti, A-N-T-E, diluvial. Anti -dilu the antediluvial world is before the deluge or before the flood. It's, so if you hear people say in the antediluvian world, you're like, what the heck are you talking about? It means the world before the flood, before the destruction is antediluvial. Um, and during that time, things were very, very different. Um, and we, we, we have some, I mean, the Bible clearly teaches it was different, but even science will show that it was different. It was a very different world at that time. The one thing that you'll see in scripture uh, that's so glaring is all the people who lived before the flood had like one major thing in common. What was it? They hardly ever died, right? They lived extraordinarily long years. And, and like, you know, wasn't, un I don't think anybody that we have record of lived less than 700 years except Enoch, but Enoch didn't die. We'll talk about him in a little bit. And then lots of people are recorded to live eight, 900 years. And you're thinking, oh, just absolutely proof that the Bible is all the pre, pre, you know, pre-flood thing is all myth. Well, of course, you're allowed to believe that. Um, some people speculate that they counted years different, which doesn't make any sense uh, why they suddenly would change how they counted years because Noah was pre-flood. Noah was during flood. Noah was after flood. And he had kids pre, during, and after flood. And they had long years and people had less years. It doesn't make any sense to think that they changed how they, how they counted years. Uh, some people, I've, I've read some things, things, instead of years, they count months. So a moon, the moon would be a year. Well, that doesn't make any sense because then they were like super young. You know, they, they, so they, at age, you know, they say at 130, uh, Adam was 130 when he had Seth. And if you counted months, that means he was 130 months old, which is really young. Um, you don't want to be having kids at 130. I mean, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, that. So they just live longer. Well, why could, could they live longer would be the question. Well, think about this. What kills us, right? It, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's sin is ultimately because the wages of sin is death. And what did sin bring into the world? But it brought death and destruction. It brought diseases. It brought uh, all the yuck. Everything that kills us 
um, is what kills us. We know this. Well, you do realize the closer we were to the Garden of Eden, the less of that we would have had. Didn't have it. You didn't have all these diseases. Um, many of you will remember, or just as you think through your life, when you were younger, people didn't die of diseases that you hear of today. It didn't even exist. It, what, did we invent diseases? Yes. Really, they did. They, diseases, because they keep forming, right? They, new things pop up because the, the longer we live, the more tragedy there is. I'm just saying, the earlier you would have been, the less that would have killed you. The other thing that is, is in a strict, strict line of difference um, before the flood and after the flood. People lived much younger after the flood. Now, there are some that lived old. I think Abraham was like 186 when he died and others were uh, plenty old, but nobody was living these five, six, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred years. Well, what if the whole world changed after the flood? What if the whole atmosphere changed? What if, I mean, what if the world radically changed because of the flood. And it also would have been a much more destructive place and a place where um, we just don't live as long as that. So you can really run with that. You can study it. It's fun stuff to study. Uh, but clearly, uh, people lived longer before the flood than they do after the flood. Um, length of life is an interesting thing. It varies from culture to culture. It varies from uh, generation to generation and things like that. And it's not just modern medicine that keeps people alive. If you just so happen to live in a perfect environment, you would live longer than medicine could keep you alive. And, and medicine, all medicine is trying to do is it's trying to delay the inevitable and it's just going after the things that are going to kill us and they're all going to kill us. Why do we die? Well, we'll, we'll learn Sunday. The, the, it's all because of the fall. I hope you come Sunday because Sunday, there's a lot of questions people have and they like struggle with evil in the world and why do bad things happen? And all. This is not that difficult. It really isn't. We sin, bad things happen, Period. If you don't like it, I don't know, tough. But I mean, really, we get into this, why could this, he was such a nice guy. How could, listen, it's sin brought death and destruction into the world. You can't pretend it didn't. And so what we, what we have is the one who overcame the world to give us something beyond the grave. We cling so tightly to this world. Why? Because we don't believe in something after this world. If you, do, if you believe in something greater than this world, you won't cling so tightly to this world and you won't be so confused that, oh my gosh, she died at 78, that's so young. Or, or 58, that's so young. Of course it's young compared to some things, but it's not young compared to eternity. And so even if you extended your life by a decade, you do realize that is a bleep compared to eternity. I'm just saying, if we got a hold of what the Bible really taught in Genesis, it would change our perspective of life change our perspective of death. It would change our perspective of diseases and we would fight it and we would go after it, but we wouldn't be distraught if something bad happened. We'd say, oh, well, that's the world we live in. Now let's go after it because we have one who's overcome the world. Change our perspective completely. Lest I get into Sunday, forget that. So let's go to chapter five of, of Genesis. I just want to get to six. Um, chapter five of the, of the book of Genesis um, it, 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 I just want you to see this. This is the genealogy. This is what most people skip. Uh, this is the genealogy from Adam to Noah. And I actually like chapter five. I'm a little bit odd with that. I like dates. I like numbers. I like this kind of stuff. Uh, and it says here, this is the written account of Adam's line. I just want to stop there because this is cool. It says this is the written account. And that's actually the word that it was a written account. This was written. Now you say, well, yeah, that's what it says. Listen, nobody thinks people a long time ago were smart. So we think, we think, oh, prehistoric man was a fool until, you know, we came along and fixed it. You know, we've got these views that, that, it used to be people were dumb. They walked around, grunted, you know, grabbed the women by the hair and carried a club. Um, it, it's really, you know, it's, why do we think that? Why do we think it's really arrogance that drives this and a bunch of cartoons? Uh, but we, we uh, namely Flintstones and, and others like that. Uh, but we, we think that anything that we, we, here's what we think. 
we think we're the smartest generation that ever lived. That's what we do. We, we think that. We think, well, we're the smartest. It's interesting to just think about that for a second. Why would we think that? Why would we think we're the smartest people? Well, we have this technology. We've got this. We can do that. We can do all the other things. And we were, we were, we were um, if you drive on 957, you know you encounter what? The Amish buggies all the time. So every day when I take uh, Jason to school, we pass at least two Amish buggies. And, and yesterday, maybe it was this morning, he said, you know, why do the Amish do that? And, and of course, you know, that's, I don't know, that's a crazy question. I said, you know what, they, they felt, you know, I said the simple answer is they felt it was better to stop technology at some point, pick the point, 1860. And they said, this is a good time to stop technology. And, and that's where they stopped. He says, man, what are they thinking? And I said, well, you know, we think we're the smartest people because we can do this, that, and the other thing. I said, watch what they do. They work hard and they value relationships. We stare at phones. I don't know. Are we a lot smarter than them? <laughs> but look what we can do. Yeah, you don't even know my name. You know what I'm saying? Is it, is it really better? I, I, I'm not... Please, I'm not going to go be Amish. Holy cow. Uh, but I just, I, was, I just had this quick response to them and said, is it better? They work hard and their whole life is based on relationships. We stare at phones. It's like, oh, when you put it that way, <laughs> we don't seem that smart. Um, so I guess, I guess what I'm saying is when we look back, don't, you're not the smartest person who ever lived. We're not the smartest generation. You could make a case we're the dumbest generation. Really? I mean, like, think of the things we have to have laws against. You know, you, you don't jump off this cliff. Imagine going to the side of a cliff and having to have a sign that says, do not jump. Wow, we never thought of that. And maybe we're the stupidest people who ever lived. There's a good chance, I mean, uh, lawyers are here because we're stupid, right? I mean, that's what... If we had any sense about us, we wouldn't be. <laughs> Listen, so are preachers. Okay, we're, we're so, pretty, pretty much anything we do is because other people can't do it because they're dumb. Carpenters are here because nobody else can build anymore. You know, you didn't have to have that. We used to know how to do things. Um, so the, but, um, but I, I, but I just want, to say, want you to see here, this was a written account. Um, and it really does, the word there is very strong that it was an actual written account way back when, uh, could have been very smart. There were a lot of people on earth before the flood, lots. I mean, there could have been, I've heard some people speculate that there may have been a billion people before the flood. How could that be? Well, first of all, according to the scripture, it was 1,600 years. Um, and again, that's just what the Bible says. You can disagree with that. I'm absolutely fine with that. I'm just saying, if you follow the genealogy, it's uh, it's actually, I can tell you exactly what it is, 1,656 years uh, from the time of Adam to the time of the flood, according to the genealogy, according to the scripture. So you got 1,600 years and like hardly anybody died. You'd have a lot of people, lots of people. I mean, Adam died in the year 930 something or something like that. I mean, can you imagine Adam's family reunion? Oh my gosh. Well, it would be everybody. I'll just give you a little hint. <laughs> Are you related to Adam? Yes. <laughs> no question. They would all be related the same way, right? Grandfather. Yeah, all of them. Uh, so so but watch this. Put up this chart with, um, it's got a bunch of lines. Looks like a graph up there. Let me just show you how this works because this is important in seeing how we get to the flood. I don't know, Andrew, if I, I didn't tell you anything I put up there before. It's in the list of things. Um, on the uh, in that in the presentation thing where the songs are, it's right in there. It's like after the five songs and then a few other graphics. He'll he'll find it eventually. Um, the um, but no, that's a different one. I'll get to that in a second. There's another one that looks like it was done with a computer, um, and not that. So fire up that other one right above that probably. Um, but the um, but from um, Adam to Noah. Here's what I want you to see. After sin came into the garden, people kept getting farther away from God. You can't see that. Don't worry about it. I'm just going to refer to it um, and, and things like that. But you, people went away from God. This is 
the natural thing to do. People don't naturally turn to God. People naturally turn away from God. Why is this important to get? I mean, this is like, well, that's pretty basic. No, you got to get this because it's only supernatural that any of us come to Christ. It's supernatural. Naturally, we turn away. Naturally, we go our, our own way. Why? Because it's our sinful nature. Our nature is to hide from God. We'll learn on Sunday that Adam and Eve hid from God. Why would you ever do that? Because that's what we do when we sin. When we sin, we hide from God, period. And, and so, so we've got here, this is, this is Genesis chapter five in a chart. Um, I heard something really funny I did. I was studying Genesis five one, one, one year. And I was going through all these numbers because I love dates. And I was tracking, you know, Adam was 130 when he had Seth. And Seth was, whatever, 105 when he had Enosh and 90. And, and I'm going through all these things and I'm charting it and I'm looking. And, I'm, and I come out to the flood and Methuselah and Lamech and Noah. I said, this is awesome. And the book I was studying, I kid you not, I turned the page and the guy had done all the work. And there was a chart. I said, are you kidding me? If I had just saved like an hour's worth of work, if I had just turned the page. And so, but that's right. I'm better for it. Yeah, that's right. So I, I'll just hide this and you guys go home and do all the work. Um, but what I want you to see here, I just want you to see a few things here as we get to the flood. First of all, uh, the top guy there, can you see it at all? See, you have better eyes than me because I'm looking at that back one. I can't see a thing. I see green and blue and a red line down the middle. But I know the top guy is Adam. Adam lived to be 900 and 930. Um, so he died in year 930. Those are just the genealogy getting down to Noah. I just want you to see this. Um, Noah was born, whatever, somewhere around, uh, whatever that is, 10, 1060, something like that. I want you to see that Noah's grandfather was Methuselah, okay, Methuselah lived like 200 and some years when Adam was on earth. And then Methuselah lived almost five or, is it 600 years? How long did he live with? It was like 600 years he was alive with Noah. Why do I want you to see this? Because these people aren't, even though we're talking maybe 1600s, I'm just teaching what the Bible says. You can speculate on different things. I'm just teaching what the Bible says. That Adam would easily, Methuselah could have known Adam. Easily, he had 250 years to get to know Adam. I'm telling you, if I was alive when Adam was alive, I am finding that dude, right? I am finding him, I'm gonna hang out with him. And if it took me 200 years, I would still have 50 years left to spend with him. So he, there is no reason to not think that Enoch and Methuselah knew Adam. So why is that important? Because Noah spent 500 years with Methuselah. Actually, I think he spent 600 years with him. Um, sometimes dates get mixed up in my head. Um, but he spent 600 years with Methuselah. You don't think he would have talked to him a lot about Adam? Come on. First hand. I mean, we're not talking Noah far, far away. We're talking Noah spent 500 years with his grandfather who knew Adam. Boom. We're pretty close. And we're talking 1,600 years. But we're really close. Really close. And, and, and the reason I want you to know that is because there's, I think there's a lot more credibility in the beginning of Genesis than we, than we oftentimes give it. A lot of times we give the beginning of Genesis, oh, it's so old, who would ever know that? How would we ever get that account? Oral tradition for 3,000 years would just be ridiculous. Well, what if I told you, and I don't know if this, how this worked out, but when you start tracing this, it might even be up there. I, I can't, again, I can't read it, but um, it, well, yeah, there he is, Abraham, way down there at the bottom. Abraham was on the earth, according to scripture, again, there could be some gaps in here, but according to scripture, find Noah's son, Shem. Where's Shem? Okay, look how long Shem lived. Keep going. Shem was alive, according to the genealogy of scripture, when Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were alive. Noah's son was, could have been alive. He, I don't think he did, but he could have been on the earth when Abraham was on the earth. You think, whoa, really? If you, I'm just saying it again. There could be some gaps here. I'm not going to just. I'm not going to my death and defending exactly Genesis five, uh, but 
there's no reason to not think it's true, just so you do know that. It's not like they intentionally put gaps in here. But, but I'm telling you, it's a lot, I think Genesis is a lot more reliable than what we oftentimes think. Um, because we're talking two to three generations could have spoken, it could have gone Abraham, could have gone Methuselah, could have gone Noah, could have gone Shem, could have gone Abraham. That's how long they were all alive. I don't know. I just think it's cool. Maybe it doesn't mean anything, but I just think it's cool because we're talking such a long time, but they lived a long time. And if you know anything about oral tradition, and of course this was a written account in Genesis 5, but if you know anything about oral tradition, oral cultures, they don't make up stories. They say the same stories over and over again. They memorize them. Pastor Peter, who is from um, really from the extreme from the bush of Kenya. His world has changed so much since then. But he grew up in a whole nother world and they would every night, they would gather around and the elders would tell stories and what you would do, and they were, they were in rhythmic, poetic ways. That's the way that oral um, cultures are. And then Peter, he, when he was 18, he could recite verbatim 72 of these stories. And so he was being trained essentially to pass on these stories to the next generation. And it wasn't like, oh yeah, you know, I remember grandpa talking about, and he said this, and yeah, it would have been this. You know, it's not that. An oral culture is very different than us hearing a story from grandpa. They would work it, they would rehearse it, they would hear it every night, and they would, and it was part of a dance, and it was part of singing, and it was entertainment, and all this stuff. And so they got it right, and so these people had the thing right. So definitely getting a little sidetracked, but that's what happens. Um, at times. Um, but, I, but I want you to see, though, that we're, we're just following one line, with it, which is Seth. That's one of the sons of Adam and Eve, Seth. Uh, Seth's line was a good line. The rest of the world was not. The rest of the world was bad. And there would have been a lot of bad lines. There was wicked, wicked people. Um, the scripture says, and, and we need to, the reason that studying the flood is important is because Jesus even said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. I probably should read that so you don't think I'm making things up. I think it's in Matthew 24. Um, as, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Why is that? What, what does that make me think? Well, we all like to think about Jesus returning, but we don't know squat about Noah. Well, how are we going to even know what it's going to be like? You know, we, we don't even believe in a flood and a destruction, and we, we spend all this time, and, and um, it's somewhere in here. I'm 24 what? 2437. Look at that. If, it's so far away from me. <laughs> like, I cannot see it back there. I know, it's hard, though, to do that. I'm, just, I'm actually half, I, I sit here thinking, what if this falls? This, as it was in the days of Noah, so destruction will befall on me. Um, in, in chapter 4, verse 30, 24, 37, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. That's a strong statement. First of all, there's a few things about that. Jesus said this. Let me tell you, Jesus believed in the flood. Jesus believed in Noah. He not only believed in it, he said He's staking his return, which I think he believed in. His return is being compared to as it was in the days of Noah. Interestingly, Jesus also said, as it was with Jonah, who was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the earth for three days and three nights and rise again. So Jesus said, I like the story of Jonah and I like the story of Noah. How cool is that? Because what are like the two of them, like, most hard-hitting, these are not true, accounts in the Old Testament, Jonah and Noah. Just like Jesus, isn't it? Yeah. He says, listen, it's all true, and if you've got hang-ups with it, that's okay. Ask a lot of questions, but just understand, says Jesus, I believe it, and oh, I was there. <laughs> so it, I like it because it gives a lot of credence, but what I want you to see, though, is... Um, uh, what, what was going on in the days of Noah? I think that's what we better pay attention to because if, if, if what was going on in the days of Noah um, is happening, hey, it might be getting real close to his time of, of coming, of returning uh, for that. So let me go through a point to a couple people in, uh, in here's, here's what I'm so tempted to do and I, I really made a commitment that I was gonna follow a schedule for 31 weeks um, 
So next week I would teach on, I think, Abraham, but I might do two parts on, on the flood. Don't tell anybody if I get there, because I'm not even going to get to the flood today. Um, but I want you to see a few people. I, we're just going to do that, because I'll take all the pressure off, and I'm just, just going to take nine minutes. I'm just going to get to the flood today. Uh, go back up to that chart, though, uh, that thing, because I want to show you some people. There's a few key people that you need to know in this genealogy. Of course, Adam, Seth was key. Remember, Cain and Abel, they're out. Uh, Abel's dead and Cain got exiled. So they're, they're gone. But Seth, watch this, here comes, this is the, the line or the seed that the Messiah is gonna come through. It's all we're interested in scripture is where's the Messiah coming through. And, and so here, there's a few people I want you to see. One is Enoch. Enoch is the seventh generation. How cool is it that a pointer just shows up? I like, I like magic. Ooh, look at that. Um, Enoch, um, it, it was a very interesting person. Uh, we don't know a lot about him. We actually, the writers of the New Testament knew more about Enoch than we did. And the early church fathers knew more about Enoch than we did because there was actually a book of Enoch that a lot of them really valued. We don't have it in our Bible. It's not canonized, so I'm not saying to do that. I'm just saying it was a, a book that they looked at and read a lot and they actually, they quoted it. Isn't that weird? The New Testament authors quoted scripture that we don't think is scripture. So I'll just let that one slide. Um, um, verse 21, when Enoch, this is of chapter five, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah, second person that's gonna be important. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked, Enoch walked with God 300 years, had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived 365 years. Enoch walked with God, then he was no more because God took him away. That's a goofy life. This is, I mean, it's his tombstone, right? Enoch, you know, age, died at age, or I don't know, went, to, lived here till he was 365, went for a walk one day, gone. gone. He was no more. I mean, it's, when that, I want that on my tombstone. And on this date, he was no more. Just gone. So Enoch at 365 years just disappeared. What happened to him? I don't know. It just seems like he didn't experience death. There was one guy that just was caught up with, with God. A couple things that are cool about that. Um, there, what does it say? It says for every man, he has to experience what? Death. Everybody does. Well, Enoch like missed it. Well, dude, you're not getting out of this. Everybody has to experience death. There was another guy, you remember? Somebody else didn't die. Elijah. Elijah didn't die. Elijah just caught up with the chariot. Well, do you know the book of Revelation talks about two witnesses coming back to the earth and getting killed? Could it be Elijah and Enoch? Why not? There's only two people in scripture who didn't die. You say, what about Moses? Moses died. We just don't they said, we don't know where his bones are. We don't know where he died. There's no reason to think Moses didn't die. Moses went up on a hill and probably died. But Elijah and Enoch didn't. All of scripture is two guys who didn't die. Why wouldn't they be the, isn't it interesting that scripture says two are coming back and are gonna be witnesses and, are gonna, and then they're gonna, right, they're gonna die, right? Two witnesses are gonna die. Sometimes I get confused. I'm, I'm way better at Genesis beginning than I am at Revelation end. So just so you, if, if you're wondering where my brain is. Um, the, the, uh, uh, but they would, so uh, just a cool thing about Enoch. Couple things about Enoch to know, and then he makes a statement that's really powerful. Enoch was a righteous man. According to the book of Jude, this is where he quotes from the book of Enoch. Um, I think it's chapter 12, 13, verse 12, 13, and 14. Jude is only one chapter. Uh, it says, Enoch, the seventh from heaven, seventh from heaven, seventh, seventh heaven. There you go. Good old show. Uh, Enoch, the seventh from Adam was a preacher of righteous, righteousness. So Enoch was a prophet. Enoch was a preacher. Enoch preached righteousness to a wicked world. Now listen to this. Converts do not make a preacher great. Results don't make a preacher great. How many converts did Enoch have? I don't know. Maybe none. You know, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. How big were his salvation messages? Uh, it would be zero. You know, you know, Noah preached for 100 years that the destruction's coming? And I, have to, I tend to think he made his kids get in the boat. 
He didn't have any results. We could say Noah was an utter failure in his ministry. He built a stupid boat and couldn't get a single convert. I think he did all right. Um, we're here because of it. Uh, but, but, uh, but Enoch was a preacher of righteousness, was a prophet, was one who spoke the word of God. Now watch it. I know I've taught this before, but I'm looking at you thinking, I don't think I've ever taught this to any of you. N- Enoch had a son named Methuselah. We know one thing about Methuselah. What is it? Bible trivia question. Oldest man to ever live is Methuselah. 969. That's a, it just, that's great. He lived old. And, and, and well, don't jump ahead of me here, Eddie, okay? All right. I mean, you, you, half the time you pretend you can't hear, and then every once in a while you just jump in. <laughs> that's right. The, the, but watch, watch what happened here, because um, he, he lived old. He was 969 years old, the oldest man who ever, in the Bible, the oldest man who ever recorded a, a living. And I used to think, and I actually can remember teaching this one time, that I, that I said this, the saddest life ever was Methuselah. Because all we know about him is he lived 969 years and he died. Like, wow, really, you couldn't do anything in those years? I mean, like, come on. Give me something to say about you. And, and so, but, what, but I just want you to hear this. And we'll just end with this. Um, Methuselah was, 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 his father was a prophet, was the preacher of righteous Enoch. And again, we've got Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah, just so you know where we're, we're going here. Enoch, gone. But Enoch named his son. He was a preacher of righteousness, and he named his son Methuselah. Methuselah could mean a, a handful of things. Most of these words are a little bit confusing. But one, one thing Methuselah can mean is a coming forth. It can mean he dies a coming forth, or it can mean even translated kind of loosely, when he dies, it will come. Okay, so he, he, gives, it, he gives him a name, and naming your kids is important. It really is. There's strong words, strong things in na- giving names. So he says, he, he dies a coming forth. So he names his son, he dies a coming forth. Watch this. Enoch's a prophet, a preacher of righteousness. He names his, he's preaching to everybody, you need to repent because judgment is coming. That's his message. You need to repent, judgment is coming. You need to repent, judgment is coming. He has a son, and he names him, when he dies, it will come. That's kind of a strong name. The preacher of righteousness and judgment says, when he dies, it will come. Well, coolest thing ever, there's a lot of things about this that make me just just love God all the more. I love the fact that Methuselah is the oldest man to ever live. Because what's that tell me? It tells me that it's not God's desire to bring judgment, right? What does is, what is Second Peter says? It is, it is, he's not slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness to be, but, but in, 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 and, uh, and he desires that none would perish, right? That none, that all would come to repentance. And he's not slow in keeping his promises, but he wants them all to come to repentance. And, and so this, this, this person of Methuselah is the ultimate picture of the grace of God. Because when he dies, it's coming. Well, as Ed alluded to, when you, when you read, and this is actually that day I was studying this. This is what I was trying to find out. Who was alive when the flood was happening? Right before, according to genealogy in Genesis chapter five, right before the flood came, Lamech, Noah's dad, died just a little bit before. Like within a year or so before. Methuselah dies the year of the flood. That's, that's like, are you serious? I mean, you, you'd have to be pretty smart at math even to make that up. He dies the year of the flood. If, you, if, you would, if you've been down to Lancaster and seen uh, the Sight and Sound Theater, they actually do a pretty cool thing with Noah, um, and they have Methuselah in the story. Have some of you seen this? Because I, I, I only saw it once. Okay, Methuselah's in the story, and he dies right before the flood comes. That's how they actually depicted it, which is kind of cool because that's what his age does. So when he died, what happened? The flood waters came. Um, no, nobody, watch this, nobody in the line of Seth was killed in the flood. Wow. Wow. 
They all died naturally. None of them experienced judgment. Lamech had died. Methuselah had died. Noah was on the ark, and Noah's three kids were on the ark. And those three ladies thought, man, after a while, they thought we married pretty well. All right, they did, they did well. And so that was it, eight people on a boat. And, but, but I want you to hear this. Throw up that chicken scratch uh, um, graphic. I'll just say this, then we'll be done. Um, and then we'll, we, will, we will talk about the flood next week. Um, this, this guy right here, let me just, let me just say this. Um, this is really what, this is history. This is world. This is what it always is. This is Genesis 1, Genesis 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and on to the cross. God has standards. This is a, a, a strong statement, very controversial statement in our world today. God has standards. Listen, my friends, if he created us, he has a right to set whatever standards he wants. I don't have to agree with him. I don't have to. I might, I might not. It's not it doesn't matter. He has standards. He's the creator. So God has standards. Therefore, when, we, when, we, when, when people don't live up to the standards, he brings judgment. That's really a principle of God. He's a righteous God, a holy God, a perfect God. The standards are, be, are to be the same. We don't live up to those standards, therefore we face judgment. That's what the world is. But first, I want you to hear this, because this is the little sidebar that makes God so awesome. But first, he sends warnings. Everybody in Seth's line, but we know through scripture, Enoch preached. <coughs> Methuselah, therefore, I'm sure, preached. We know that Noah preached for a hundred years. He preached. Warnings, warnings, judgment's coming. Everybody laughed at him. He kept preaching. Warning, judgment's coming. Everybody laughed at him. Warning, judgment's coming. We, he sends warnings. What does he also do? God provides an escape, quote, salvation. He provides a way out. Always, God always has a way out. Nobody has to face judgment. God always provides a way out. He sends a warning. We're part of the warning army. Warning, judgment's coming. You don't have to face it. There's a way out. In the, in the case of Noah, it was literally an ark. It was literally a boat, uh, an ark, a salvation, a way out. And the third thing, God is not desiring to bring judgment. Methuselah is 969 years old, the oldest person ever, is an absolute in-your-face picture of, I'm going to be patient because maybe, maybe today when they hear Noah preach, they'll turn. Maybe. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. He's patient. He's patient. He's patient. And he's waiting. Why hasn't Jesus returned yet? Because he's patient. He's patient. You say, well, gosh, he's never coming back. Listen, be thankful he hasn't come back. How many of you are glad he didn't come back 20 years ago, 30 years ago, five years ago? You know, I look back and say, well, I'm glad God didn't come in whatever year. Because a lot of the people I know today who are rock solidly in love with Jesus wouldn't have been on the boat. So I'm really thankful that he delays. And of course, we all, you know, it says you want him to come back. But I don't want him to come back at the expense of those who are ready to get in the boat. And so the delay is just grace, 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 Methuselah's grace. But then also, in the end here, and, and, but he does follow through with judgment. The flood did come. It did come. Everybody had a chance. Judgment does eventually come. That's what happens in the world today. It's what has happened, and it's what will happen. But it's never God's desire to just squash people his desire to pull them out and offer salvation. We'll get into the, we'll, we'll, let's just, we're just going to get into the flood next week. Forget this. Um, you can't, I knew I couldn't, I couldn't even get to chapter six. I, and don't, here's what I want you to do. Do not let me teach on the Nephilim next week. So if I start teaching the Nephilim, tell me to stop because it's super cool and super fun, but there's no reason to. I'll just mention one thing about it next week and then we'll jump right. <laughs> <laughs> Just one. All right. Well, Father, thank you. I pray that even as we look into the past, that we have hope for the future. As we, as we learn more about our beginnings, have us know more about our current situation and have us always be looking with hope to the future. Father, I thank you. I thank you that 
Uh, of course, so much of this, uh, every, our whole walk with you, we have to take by faith. But I thank you that it's never asking us just completely irrational faith, that it is reasons and there's good stuff. And I just thank you for that as well. Thanks for these great people here. Walk with us, guide us, and we bless you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. All right, um, next week, uh, same time, same place. I didn't even tell you why we started at 635 on the scripture, so we'll skip that. God bless you all. See you Sunday. Bring lots of people out. We're having a good time. Yeah.